Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Matt Brown Show. This is the Private Placements Perspective Series, where we're talking to venture capital firms and figuring out what makes them tick. With me on the line is Alex Nascimento, the uh, head wig, the top of the pyramid, the head of the food chain <laughs> at 7, 7, 7CC Invest. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, the privilege is on mine, Alex. So why don't you give our audience around the world a bit about, uh, you know, the elevator pitch about what you guys are up to? Yeah, so we're a firm that focuses on tokenizing real-world assets. Um, we have a thesis of tokenizing structured debt or high-yield products, uh, agricultural products, and environmental assets such as carbon credits. So how is it evolving? It seems to me like uh, blockchain is flavor of the month one week and then the next month it isn't. So how has the FTX scandal, for instance, impacted your, your portfolio? Uh, fortunately, we didn't have any exposure to FTX, mainly because we are a U.S.-based firm and FTX was not, was a Bahamas firm. So we mainly work with Coinbase and uh, the other U.S. firms. Um, so frankly, we didn't have an exposure to FTX aside from some FTT tokens, which all are worthless now, but uh, nothing that was significant. Mm -hmm. What makes you guys different, would you say? Uh, I think that our key sauce is kind of like look at how the technology can bridge the native blockchain and crypto world to the institutional world, right? Our thesis has always been either this is going to be institutionalized or it will continue to be a tech play. And frankly, I think that it has been. Uh, we just saw like last week or a couple of days or a few days ago, Fidelity go silent on launching their Bitcoin uh, platform. We see a variety of banks looking into it all the way from Chase to Bank of America. Uh, then if we talk globally, then the list of institutional players adopting it is vaster mm -hmm. than the time we have on this podcast. All right. Um, seems to me, I'm curious to, to, to understand from a commercialization perspective, um, as a technology, blockchain obviously promises a lot. Um, from a commercialized, commercialization perspective, do you see trends-wise that startups are able to commercialize blockchain technology now when we know that Web3 as an idea is, is not quite here yet? It hasn't really been fully adopted uh, for, for various reasons. So from a commercialization perspective, um, Alex, do you feel um, that uh, companies are, are more easily able to commercialize or startups are more easily able to commercialize in the space today? Sure, sure. I think that there is a uh, vast number of applications for blockchain. It depends which space the specific startup wants to play in. You can go all the way from utilizing the technology to commercialize uh, new songs from garage bands uh, that have a very niche audience and that can grow exponentially. Uh, you can do similar things that uh, the technology allows for breakthroughs in the supply chain industry, uh, as well as in the financial sector. So one of the ways we tend to look at blockchain is kind of like how people looked at mobile technology in the late 90s. Uh, in the late 90s, it was like one application, you picked up your mobile phone, you called someone else, that was it. You were just not tied to your house or, you know, the, the, the specific wired machine. Um, and then now, like, our lives are, are, surrounding, are, are surrounding mobile technology as opposed to mobile technology surrounding our lives. Right. I ask you, how long can you stay without your phone? And I think that probably no more than a few hours. Um, so we believe that blockchain technology will be the the next and massive adopt, adopted technology like mobile technology was in the 2000s and 2010 and 2020. Mm -hmm. So when do you feel like that's going to happen? Because that's the question I know a lot of us are curious to know. Like when is this blockchain wave going, the actual technology adoption, I mean, not just um, the speculation over the Bitcoin price or Ethereum, whatever. Um, so when would you say is this uptick, this adoption curve going to start to happen? 
it's hard to pinpoint like a specific date, right? With any adoption of new tech, it, it involves a, ro- a lot of different uh, players that need to come together, especially like government, institutional players, uh, early adopters, and, and so on and so forth, like retail and so forth. Uh, but we, we've we seen in the past, call it 10 years, um, really like the technology really taking space, right? In 2012, people would talk about Bitcoin like if it was magic internet money. And today is a financial asset that is distributed and commercialized by some of the large institutions in the world. So if you say the industry has roughly, call it 10 years, maybe 12, if you really stretch it, I think this is the first uptick. And then the next uptick is as we evolve into a Web3 environment, into environments where people are going to be much spending much more time in the metaverse or an app or similar uh, platforms that could be called the metaverse, uh, which technology is going to be the technology that allows you to connect your refrigerator to your mobile device, to your bank account, to your Amazon account, so that when you run out of milk, your refrigerator sends a signal, you click a button, and then Amazon sends the milk to your to your uh, home, right? And when you have a variety of different databases that need to be integrated, the, the most common thing is to use a decentralized database. I would say we're not on Web 3 today. I would say we are on Web 2.5. We're no longer on 2.0, uh, and we're not yet at 3.0. But we're certainly somewhere in the middle. So if I would shoot the number, give it another 5, 10 years. Hmm. That's um, it's a it's, and that window of time is not a long time, right? Well, ten years is right, but five years not so not much. so much. Yeah. So your um, your fund uh, around seven hundred million. How much of that is actually institutional capital versus, say, just private LPs? Uh, most of it. Oh, really? Yes, yeah, that's interesting. I figured as much. Um, and when you think about the macroeconomics uh, around uh, crypto as an example, maybe just more broadly around the financial system at the moment, obviously blockchain is a huge play, uh, you know, space to play there from a DeFi and many other applications perspective. Um, how much does the macroeconomics impact your, your thinking around when to cut checks or not or which startups to back or not? Well, I think that any savvy or responsible fund manager or financial advisor would say that macro always uh, ticks, right, and, and and plays a heavy pull in it. Um, uh, we're seeing this kind of like last reiteration of the Bitcoin ecosystem going against some of the macro trends like SVB or Credit Suisse or some of these larger banks that are that are going down. Um, but you have to look at the macro. You have to understand where things are going. Unless you're investing in something very niche, right? And if you're investing in something very niche, then you have to look at the segment of that market. Um, so I would say, yeah, macro always plays a big role in our thinking. Mm-hmm. And so what's the source of your deal flow typically? Um, and what factors do you look for when making an investment in the blockchain crypto space? Uh, we look at mainly things that could be disintermediated. So if you look at, so we frankly focus on the three thesis I mentioned, right? Uh, high yield products, uh, agricultural assets, and environmental assets. So if you look at those um, high yield products, those are usually only products that institutional players can touch, right? Because it takes a minimal investment that's sometimes or most times um, not attainable by the average retail investor. So that's one. Uh, If you look at like agro products or agro commodities, 
some of the future contracts that you may look into soy or, or other commodities require a significant upfront commitment. And if you could fractionalize that, you could give people exposure to future contracts of soy, for example. And if you believe that the world only has more people and that we're going to have to produce more food, then it's, I would call it a no brainer. Maybe people might disagree with me, but uh, I don't see us going, not certainly in the near future, last people in this world and last food, right? Um, so you get people exposure to that. Um, and if you look at environmental assets, you have mainly two main uh, certifications of all carbon credits in the world that already said that they don't like their carbon credits to be tokenized. Mm. Um, you in the next, we're in 2022, in the next 20 years, 25 years, you're going to need more carbon credits that there are available to decarbonize the way the world is going. Mm. When you get pitched by a startup, where does it go wrong? Um, prior to my life in blockchain, I used to invest in general startups, right? From bubblegum to Don Food Online. And I, I would not even say that this is my quote, right? Because it's not. It's just um, I was part of Tech Coast Angels, uh, which is the large um, angel investment firm, angel investment group in California. And one of the things that we always talked about and we always coached startups is make sure you have three things, right? You have a, a unique selling proposition. You know why you're different and why you're standing in front of these people and why people should buy your product. B, you have decent financials and you thought through the financials. And C, and most importantly, you have a clear ask. Uh, I, I many times sat through pitches where the the entrepreneur didn't have a clear ask. You ask me, okay, how much are you raising? Well, it depends. No, it doesn't depend. You need to know how much you're raising, right? Because if you're wanting a check, so I need to know how much if if I have the money to give you. So I would say that those are like the three pitfalls that any any entrepreneur pitching any kind of investor, that being early stage ventures all the way to the sequoias of the world, um, those three would be my, my go-to. Mm -hmm. And when you think about uh, your greatest success and failure in uh, venture investing or early stage investing, what would you say has made the difference? That's a really good question. Um, I think team, team, and team. Uh, those, you know, it caught me off guard that one, but uh, but I would say it's definitely the people, mm. because you, you may have a great idea, you may have like the right connections, right? You may be the son of the biggest distributor in your segment. If you don't have talent and you're and you're not good people, and people don't like you, it's challenging yeah. especially if you're an entrepreneur you have to convince people to follow your dream right and uh alex when you think about all the startups looking to raise money today what's one piece of advice you would like to give them i would say that today we are in a bear market for uh risk capital right and and, and frankly for for people that listen and, and uh, watches, uh, maybe they question why we're in a why we are in a, a bear market for risk capital, and it's mainly because interest rates around the world are skyrocketing. So, if you're a money manager, why am I going to put a significant part of my portfolio in a risky asset, that being crypto or that being a startup, when I can get a risk-free return that's sizable. Mm. Uh, some of the markets that we heavily invest in, like Brazil, have 15% free risk interest rate. Um, and, and that's a safe play, right? So in an environment where you, you have 
um, a lack or, or a bear market of risk-free capital, the best thing you can do is build and really focus on your product so that when the market shift and the market will shift because we all seen cycles, you've seen cycles, I've seen cycles, anyone in this industry saw many cycles. So the market will shift. And when the market shifts, you are fully prepared with the best product in your industry. That's a really good advice, actually. You know, just focus on your product. Don't worry about the market. It'll turn. Yeah. yeah. That's really good advice. Tell me, Alex, when you um, when an exit opportunity comes along, so you have a portfolio company, like Lesha said, you mentioned you're really interested in uh, startups that have you know institutional maps or roadmaps. Um, so assuming you have a big financial services company, Bank of America, they want to go buy this decentralized finance application thing, whatever the case is, how do you prioritize and evaluate an exit? Like where do you stand on on the process in terms of engaging with your portfolio uh, startup, the one that's being acquired? Uh, in the context of an exit, do you let them do their own thing? Do you tell them, "Hey, you know, sell this thing now" because you <laughs> like, like you built this platform, so you know, strategically, this is where you want to go. Like, where do you fall? And that, I think that's a is a really clever question uh, because it all depends, right? It depends on like how much of the cap table am I representing. Uh, it depends if I have a vote, if I don't have a vote, if if I'm a silent shareholder or if I'm not. But assuming all things are equal, one of the things that I always tell entrepreneurs is that if you were talented enough to reach your first exit, you were talented enough to reach your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and be a zero entrepreneur. What you cannot afford is not to have liquidity. So if you have a good opportunity and somebody wants to buy your, your company, my opinion has always been sell it because you're talented. You will find something else. It's kind of like if you're a basketball player, right? Somebody wants to take you from your like A team to like your next team. Okay, am I going to be tied to my first team, believing that my first team is going to be the world champion? Or am I going to go play for another team? Mm. I agree. Just sell. <laughs> like, like, dude, I've been there, man. Like, and it's interesting because you think, oh, no, there another, another acquirer will come along for sure. Are we that good? I mean, if one's going to come along and make us an offer, why wouldn't another one come along? It's like, yeah, <laughs> okay. You keep drinking that Kool-Aid, son. <laughs> Especially like, because markets move so quickly. Like, they really do. And, you know, uh, one, you know, it's like, if you're in Q4, right, and, and it's a, an institution looking to acquire a platform from a startup that does something in blockchain, whatever, um, like their priority, the next quarter can change. And then suddenly the deal's off, you know. Um, and these things you cannot control. And, and to your point, like if you're going to get that opportunity and, re and create that opportunity once, you can do it again. Um, and I think the, the rub is knowing like what kind of founder are you? Like are you the guy that builds and sells? Or are you the kind of guy that's a, you know, a one hit wonder and hopefully the stars will align and, but that's it, you know, and you do get both and you need to know like where you fall as the founder. Exactly. And, and you pointed out something that just happened, right? If you look historically and I'm not even going like in history books, just go until like November, 2021, uh, market was so hot. Everybody was in it. All the major banks were looking at blockchain. Solana was like, for those of you who follow crypto, it was skyrocketing. It was like the hottest protocol in the market. And you fast forward to April 2022, which was like almost just a quarter away, a little bit more, uh, when Bitcoin Miami conference came around. From that point on, it was just down the drain up from like almost 70,000 to like 17,000. And what if you passed on an acquisition in November? Mm -hmm. You woke up a year later, like mm -hmm. in dire situation. Yeah, it sucks, eh? <laughs> I can imagine waking up being that guy. Yes, it's, it's going to be horrible. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing, but it's not really a, f a laughing matter. Uh, that's just reality, right? Like, and that's one thing that I, 
that I I think it's it's hard for entrepreneurs, right? Um, is that you put so much effort into your your um, venture, you fight with your wife, people tell you you're crazy, you quit your job, you put a bunch of that in your credit card. You're so committed that that thing is almost like your child and you're trying to sell your child. And, and that's, that's my point, right? That's not your child. You are your child. Mm -hmm. If you, if you bear one successful venture, you will bear another one. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So um, when you do cut a check though, Alex, do you, have a preferred sort of capital structure? Do you go with a safe? If they're pre-revenue, if they're revenue generating, do you do convertible? Do you price the round? How do you approach that? Uh, that's also a very good question because it depends on the jurisdiction that you're purchasing or, or coming into the company, right? In the States, safes are, are acceptable. Uh, some legal counsel will tell you it's not a good deal. You should do a convertible note. Um, some people say, yes, do it, it's fine. Uh, in other countries, it's just not existing. I think that one of the things we always try to do is to have a say. And depending on the set, on the check size, a board seat is, is something that we don't negotiate. Um, but I think it's less about the structure because the structure can be tokens. Right, especially in the in the blockchain space, you can get early tokens that if the project flies, it's immediately liquid. Um, so I think it's more on the governance side. How's what's the role of AI going to be in blockchain? Because it seems to me like blockchain as an adoption, you know, idea it hasn't fully matured just yet. And AI is now a flavor of the month. It was kind of like NFTs were just before, you know, uh, AI and now NFTs are like the, dir the dirty school child. <laughs> like nobody wants to play with him. Uh, but AI is now like the, the cool kid on the on the street corner block. So, um, you know, I'm curious to say, when do you feel like, like walk us through, you're on the cool, cool face of it. So AI integrating with blockchain is super interesting. Um, as a concept, because there are these exponential technology trends, aren't they? Like that are promising just a fundamental change of everything. And I'm very curious to get your view. Like, how do you see the those two technologies integrating or blending in the blockchain space? Like, what are some of the use cases that you see, um, you know, from your portfolio potentially? Yeah, uh, I think that it's it's almost scary what we're going through with AI, right? Um, I'm a big fan of the movie The Matrix, and I think that The Matrix really arrived. Um, so I frankly scratch my head and, and try to figure out how to use AI for the benefit of the humankind. Uh, and I don't know if, if other AI um, startups or protocols are, are considering that at the forefront of their decision making. Uh, but if you think like which job is not going to be impacted by AI. The other day I thought about one job that might not, which is like a, a high-end chef from a, from a high-end restaurant. Hmm. That might still take a, take a while, but eventually it will. Because you know, you're going to have like a oven that will cook your food with the recipes that an AI... Yeah, man. Like, dude, there's not a single job. Like, think about it. Like, uh, you know, just before this, I was watching a Boston Dynamics clip. I mean, these things are doing like somersaults in the fucking air. You know what I mean? <laughs> Come on, dude. Do you think that thing won't be able to cook a freaking meal for you? You know what I mean? Yeah, it will. <laughs> so, like, yeah. even a hairdresser. Like, I saw one now with, um, with uh, like, a, a robotic arm. Like, I, I will never, ever do this. I will never, ever be this guy. But like where you go to the dentist and you have a robot shove its, <laughs> shove its stuff in your mouth and it's like looking at it and cutting you open and stuff, like no, like just no. Like I won't do it at a principle. Um, but um, but you're right. I don't see, I really don't see a single thing. Like, I don't know. It's probably like a game to play with GPT-4. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, which jobs will not be affected by you? Okay, fuck it. Let me do that now, actually. Um, <laughs> let me actually do that. 
see what it says. Yeah, it's an interesting question, right? Yeah. And and then it's kind of like, well, then what do you do? Do you invest in everything that's AI related and hope where it goes? Do you massively regulate how AI operates? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm curious about what, okay, so, so I, I asked it. So which jobs will not be impacted by GPT-4? Well, GPT-4 and other advanced AI models, models rather, have uh, the potential to transform many industries and job roles. There are still certain jobs that are less likely to be significantly impacted in the short to medium term, blah, blah. Some examples of jobs less likely, physicians and surgeons. Okay, so that's the dentist thing. Mental health. Okay, maybe, but surely you would have a robot talking to you as opposed to a therapist. Uh, artists and I think the, this one I actually agree with. Artists and creative professionals. That's probably one that uh, that resonates with, with me the most, right? Like that creative process is not something that you can easily just m like mimic. You know what I mean? Although having said that, I was actually watching this clip um, on, uh, on, uh, on LinkedIn the other day where I like my one of my previous uh, businesses was a record label so I used to produce music right like that was my thing um and um and then uh I like now they've integrated chat into the production environment so let's say you didn't like the timbre of a sound or you didn't like the you know the, the key or whatever you could say drop the key and it would drop the key or, was, or you could say you know a pregio this and combine it with that so essentially you're still co-creating creatively with AI even in that space. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 don't, I just don't see a space where like it's not going to be there, you know? Yeah. I think you touched on a, on a very interesting point. Uh, if you assume that there isn't going to be a space where you are not going to be affected by AI, then the only op other option is to co-create. Right. And then how some of the protocols and some of the startups infuse that kind of collaborative environment between AI and, and the human machine uh, to drive even better products, better results. Mm. Yeah, maybe judges or lawyers, you know, but... Depends on where you are, right? If you're in the States, then it's all based on previous um, previous claims, previous judgments, so... yeah. Numbers and okay, I got you. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, uh, when you think about uh, you know the world of venture capital, we mentioned ten years being a long way away, five years not so long. Uh, but when you think in the next ten years, like how do you see the world of venture capital evolving potentially, even through the use of AI? Yeah, I I think that we're gonna see what we saw in the blockchain space, right? And I, and this is a, a, it's something that I think a lot about. When I first started doing this, you, you looked at things from like bottom up. You looked at a early stage company that were two people in a garage with a great idea, a pitch deck and a convincing story, right? And you would back them and they would go and they would, develop a prototype, an MVP, and that thing would halfway work and, and then put a little bit more money, it would work better. Um, then you did the right product market fit and you struggled around that until you pivot the product or the service so that it would fit uh, the, the needs of the market and the demand of the market. And as that scaled, the, that company went to like a growth stage and a growth venture of funding, and it would eventually hit an IPO or an exit or a merger. Mm. Uh, and then 2016, 17 came along, and you kind of turned that upside down because it was no longer bottom up. It was top down, right? You had one PDF and sometimes you look and people were were curious. Just look at the first early ICO documents. There were like word documents and they were raising like if not hundreds, tens of millions of dollars uh, on on like a word PDF. Uh, 
because you were so decentralized and people were so interconnected that the ten dollars from a million people is ten million bucks. Mm. So I think that later stage companies will continue to see this kind of more institutional game because they're needed. So you're in a in a different path of growth where you need that kind of institutional hand holding and um, and modeling. But eighty percent of the venture capital world will be in the hands of the people. Mm. Very interesting idea, Haim. And tell me, what are you struggling with or what keeps you up at night when you think about the world of venture capital? The AI question is one that certainly keeps me up at night. Um, and the way it's it's getting adopted and, and the implications of what's going to happen. Um, on, on the other side, on a, on a more immediate side, I think that we are going to go through a very different cycle of the macroeconomic scenario, one that we have not seen before, uh, one where we're, we're going to just live for the foreseeable future in a hyperinflation. And when I talk to some of like old time executives of banks, a question that I always ask is, okay, so when you were 20 years old, right, how many products your bank sold 20 40 now that you're 60 70 how many products does your bank sells you don't even know right because it's like so many assets um when we started investing in in bitcoin and blockchain there were about less than 100 coins if i look today there's more than thirty thousand in the spam of like eight years Mm. so you're just going to go into this module of printing money, building assets in a in a very decentralized environment, which I think it's hard for, for the average Joe, right? The average Joe is going to be more and more crushed under this hyperinflation model. And it's, it's frankly quite scary. It's like, how are people going to survive as they get older because they're not going to have any savings? And things are only going to become more expensive. Yeah, I, that's what I worry about, dude. Is like that that time, you know, when I mean, I don't know how old, how old you are, but like I'm forty, turning forty four this year, and we're like about, fucking, yeah, we're exactly the same age, forty fucking four, dude. You know, like oh my god. And I remember when I was twenty four, going, I'm old. Now I'm like, oh, now I'm telling my mates, like, yeah, but forty forty four is the new sixty four, you know, <laughs> or like, yeah. what is it? Forty four is the new twenty four. Sorry, yeah, you yeah. know, because of like whatever your rationale is. Uh, but um, but like I do think about that, you know, like, hmm, because things do get expensive. I mean, the other thing, more expensive all the time, and as you as you point out, like this hyperinflation thing, seemingly not going away. I mean, it's like if you, what did a chappy bubblegum cost you, like, or whatever, you know, 20 years ago? It's like a fraction of what it is now. So your earnings potential has to map to that or, you know, exceed that. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're going to be in trouble. And, and I think a lot of people aren't thinking about, you know, the, the reality of that. If you are displaced through AI as an employee or whatever the case is, um, or your business is made redundant because of AI. You know, like this is what pissed me off with Microsoft was like they, they, they basically, you know, gave OpenAI a ten billion dollars worth of Azure credits, and they said, "Cool, we, <laughs> you know, we're going to take forty nine percent of you to drive our consumption revenue because that was getting hammered, right?" Um, so there's more to that story. Uh, but then you had a pro- you know a proliferation of AI enabled startups that were using open AI to do cool things to make a difference to ma- increase productivity whatever and now it's just being centralized again it's like fuck sex you know can we just like you know like w- it's just like wherever you look like there's lots of uncertainty I'm very positive though that you know given these sorts of shows these sorts of conversations that uh, you know people can become self-aware and I think oftentimes that's the difference is like those who make it are the ones that are self-aware on like what's actually going on I mean if I talk about like AI to my wife I'm like listen yeah this is revolutionary like everything is fucking changing like every single job everywhere every planet every company everything is going to change fast and she hasn't even used it and I'm like listen (laughs) <laughs> like you have to use this thing like it's not a nice to have you must use it like it's too powerful 
Um, and uh, anyway, so it's just this idea of self-awareness, you know, and becoming self-aware enough to make appropriate decisions now so that you can protect your future tomorrow. Yeah, and be self-sovereign, right, um, is what I – so one of the things we didn't talk about is that I teach at UCLA and I, and I teach blockchain uh, applications for finance. Uh, one of the things I always tell my students is, is like, look at the, at the rate of inflation and then look at the rate of your, of your potential earnings. You're more and more and more behind the curve. So if you're more and more and more behind the curve, how do you protect that, right? Because the older you get, the, the, the wider the gap will be. Um, so what are the, and this is kind of a conversation outside from venture capital, but in line with, what are the investments you're going to make that are going to give you self-sovereignty and self and, and financial empowerment? Mm. So think twice about buying that, that new car, you know, and, and make a wise investment. Yeah. It's 100% uh, true. I mean, little thing is a little graph I saw on Twitter. Um, basically, if you put like 20% down on a $600,000 home, for the first five years, you haven't even touched the principal for five years, you know, and it's like, oh, no, but you own a home. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, okay, is it? Well, is the, is, the, is the real estate market appreciating enough faster than your rate of, like it's, people don't get it. Like they, they don't think about these things. Uh, again, you're right to the to your point around uh, uh, self awareness and stuff. And you know, kudos to you, man, for teaching these kids because I do believe, like the kids, like my child, you know, um, I expose him to Chat GPT. I'm, I, I make GPT for like uh, telling bed, bedtime stories, and he laughs himself to death. <laughs> but it's like you know, you have to t like expose them to the stuff, and the sooner the better, I think. Yeah, or or just you know, provoke the question. It's like. You think you're going to live forever and make money forever? Or at some point, your earning potential is going to decrease, right? Take a look at your grandparents. Your grandparents were lucky enough that they could buy a home. I don't know if the average person today can afford a home. No, they're not. And there's a huge housing shortage also. There's not enough homes anyway. So, yeah. So um, let's wrap this up, uh, Alex. If I could give you the keys to the Matt Brown Show time machine and you could go back to yourself uh, on day one of your whole venture capital sort of journey and give yourself one piece of advice about investing in uh, startups, what would that one piece of advice be? Mm, you should have given me this, uh, this question previously so I could really think through. But I think that out of the top of my head or, or at least like the, the most natural question – or a natural answer that I could think of is a big, be very curious, right? Just like you're doing with your child. Expose your child, expose yourself to what is out there. And if you don't know uh, the difference between what you have now and what you had 20 years ago, is just like all the information is out there. If you just if you just put a little bit of effort, you will understand what are the frontier technologies that are driving your your life and your future and the future of your family. Um, so try to understand those because those are going to potentially give you insights into some of the, the best decisions you can make. Not only if you're not an investor for your career, uh, just like you said, right, you need to know how to use AI. And if you're looking for a job and you just don't know how to use it, then you're potentially not the best candidate. Mm -hmm. um, so explore the explore as much as you can frontier tech. Uh, be curious and be hungry. Mm. Hungry. Hungry for the win. That's, <laughs> that's, the, the win. Yeah. that's the one, man. Keep pulling on that string. So on that bombshell, thank you, Alex, for being on the show. It's been a privilege having you here, buddy. And uh, yeah, man, let me know when Web3 arrives. Drop me an email. <laughs> Well, I certainly do. Thanks a lot, Matt. It was a pleasure being here. And anytime, uh, it will be a pleasure to come again. Anytime. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Have a good one.